May I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? The next part of our session here is to, as you all know, we had the lightning talk contest. And the next video that we're going to show is um, Ukraine in crisis. And I suggested to Catherine that we show the video now, just before defending the defenders, because I want you to see what happens when in a country that does not have good governance tries to take over another country that's protecting its democracy. And so please take a look, watch this. It's not a very happy video, but it's uplifting towards the end. So with that, and also I would like you to know that the person in the video is here with us, Anna Yarozova of the Church World Service. <clears throat> and, and maybe you can talk to her after, after this session. But it's really an important intro to the topic that we're going to talk about this afternoon. So with that... Hello, I'm Anna Yuzurova and I'm Program Manager for Church for Service. Ten years ago, my best friend recorded the famous video, I am a Ukrainian. Then she stood in the center of Berlin, Kiev, and I just became a mother, and I was sure that the war would never happen. At that time, I did not know that in eight years, we would be forced to seek shelter in the United States to avoid a death. Today, I record this video to say, I am Ukrainian. And this is one of the more than 40 million other stories of Ukrainians who became victims of Russian aggression. At the beginning of 2022, I was a successful lawyer in the government and suddenly everything changed. The main questions were how not to die, where to find food, where to sleep, whether my mom is still alive. Values have changed. We have packed two small suitcases in which we have to fit all our life. And at the invitation of completely unfamiliar Americans who later became our family, we flew to New Jersey. I knew that I would do everything possible to help my motherland. But before that, I faced the traditional questions for the refugees from why does everyone ask how I'm doing but do not expect an answer to the question where will I work? with my irrelevant education. For one, more than one year, I have been working in the church world service. I lead several programs and already coordinate support for refugees from different countries. We help to receive benefits, find housing, become self-sufficient. It is my team that meets people at the airport and takes them to the first housing in the United States. My work teaches me how to learn. Learn from our mistakes learn new cultures, learn to find solutions, be fair, to learn to be human in decisions, actions, thoughts. I will fight against hatred and anger, spread support, faith and humanity. I am Ukrainian, but I cannot go home. The war continues. My parents, friends and relatives do not know if Russian bomb will hit their homes tonight. When Russia comes, it kills. Let's unit humanity together, ignite a spark of hope, so that one day when our children ask what you did when the world was in the crisis, each of us will have the answer to be proud of. Thank you very much, Anna, for sharing your experience with us. Um, when we think about the most important factors for improving economic growth or improving access to health and education services or addressing the issues um, that affect us because of climate change or poor use of resources, one factor that comes to mind immediately is good governance. 
We know that elections are key to the quality of governance that any country will have. And this year, as you may have heard, more than 60 countries are holding elections or have held elections. I believe India is having their elections right now as we speak. We also know that democracy is not a one and done issue. It needs a constant protection and nurturing. So the next panel will discuss the importance of protecting those that protect the democratic space and will share lessons learned in addressing the challenges to it. But before we start with the panel, I would like to introduce um, Mr. Leland Cruvant, who is the president and CEO of Creative Associates International. With Leland's deep experience in strategic planning, finance, technology, and program management, Creative has played a key role in areas such as elections, good governance, education, economic growth, and youth development. Under Leland's leadership, Creative has successfully supported countries around the world to realize the positive change that they're looking for for themselves. And so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Leland Cruant. Gloria, I didn't memorize all the nice remarks I was going to, is, is my notebook? All right. Well, I do like speaking extemporaneously. Um, <clears throat> uh, Gloria, thanks uh, for the nice introduction. Gloria has just recently joined Creative's Global Advisory Board. Thank you for joining us. And uh, if people in the room are wondering, uh, and some of you have learned from experience, if Gloria ever gives you advice, you should take it. It's excellent advice. Um, <clears throat> we're here today. Uh, I'd like to introduce um, Shannon Green, the Assistant Administrator for Democracy, Human Rights, and Governance. Um, we're pleased to be. Uh, we're pleased to be in this year when half of the world will soon be casting ballots. At the same time, uh, it does feel as if that's something to celebrate, but there's associated risk. It feels as if democracy itself is on the ballot this year. So we're looking forward to positive change, but we're also here to work for that positive change. What's important is that this panel, like many of the people in this room, are working in smart and clever ways to be supporting uh, <clears throat> the effective democracy that we need that avoids the risks of electoral violence and that makes sure that the people's voice is heard. So we're all big supporters of the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Governance, and we all support Shannon Green. So with that, please let me welcome the Assistant Administrator, Shannon Green. Thank you, Leland, for that introduction. And folks, what you can't see from your seats or from online is that he did that without any notes. Um, so thank you for setting up the panel so perfectly. And thank you, Gloria, for also reminding everybody of what this is all about um, and what we're here to talk about today. And most importantly, thank you to the CID US chapter for inviting us to be here today to talk about an issue that's so critical for both democracy and development, and that is defending the defenders in the year of elections. So I'm Shannon Green. I have the honor of leading USAID's first Bureau for Democracy, Human Rights, and Governance, which I think is a real testament um, to how central this work has become to development. And I'm really happy to be here with so many development change makers around the world uh, particularly these three folks who are on the panel with me today, all of whom are fierce advocates 
who are rising to meet the challenges facing us today when it comes to de democratic development. So we all know the statistics. We are in our 18th year of democratic decline, which means that there is a lot at stake with the, this year's elections. But I think for this crowd, the thing that's really important to underscore is it's not just high stakes for those of us who care about and are focused on democracy, human rights, and governance. The stakes are also really high when it comes to development because we know that a country's democratic trajectory can make a real difference in its development trajectory. It also, frankly, makes a big difference in how we as the U.S. government and we as U.S. aid are able to partner with governments. So we all have a lot at stake this year um, and a lot to be concerned about, in particular, what often happens in the lead up to elections, and that is increased threats to the defenders of democracy who are trying to make sure that elections at least present the opportunity of being competitive and inclusive and free and fair and participatory. So what we're seeing in too many countries around the world is regimes using highly sophisticated strategies to tilt the playing field in order to preserve their power well in advance of election day. This playbook includes muzzling independent voices, curbing basic rights, limiting political competition, and undermining the very activists who are trying to uphold checks and balances through new laws that are restricting non-governmental organizations or media who are receiving assistance from international donors. And make no mistake about it, this is not incidental. This is part of a strategy that some incumbents are using to really attack the core pillars of democracy, which of course include elections in order to safeguard their power. However, we like to say that the glass is not um, half full, it is half empty. And that is because every single day we bear witness to the courageous efforts of human rights defenders, civic activists, anti-corruption champions, and democratic reformers who are fighting for freedom, for more inclusive and equitable governance, for human rights, and yes, for free and fair elections, often at great personal cost. And I think that is really the meaning of what it means to be a world in crisis, but with sparks of hope. We can't lose hope because when elections are allowed to be even nominally democratic and participatory and competitive, you have the real chance of turning things around. And we've seen that, fortunately, in a couple of cases that I think are notable. For instance, in Guatemala, indigenous activists took to the streets to peacefully protest efforts to overturn and discount the results of the 2023 elections. And now we have a president who is a true anti-corruption crusader who at least can help turn the country um, and put it on a new path. In Liberia early this year, earlier this year, the peaceful transfer of power between opposing political parties served as an inspiring counterpoint to un unconstitutional changes of government and the re-entrenchment of the military and politics in other parts of West Africa. And of course, in Poland, the recent victory of the democratic opposition was a testament to the resilience of Polish civil society in the face of government attacks and mounting illiberalism. The election results have reshaped not only the country's political trajectory, but also has really important implications for the future of Europe. These are examples um, that are very positive, but of course they would not come about if it were not for the dogged efforts of civil society, government officials, election observers, people who are running election management bodies, anti-corruption activists, the media, and so many others who play an instrumental role in preserving and protecting democracy. And we have three such people on the panel 
you are really in for a treat today because these three folks are some of the most dynamic defenders of democracy that I know, and we are very fortunate to have them here with us today. So we have all the way to my left, Kehinde Togun, who is the Managing Director for Public Engagement at Humanity United, where he leads efforts to build understanding, promote accountability, and martial action among key stakeholders to cultivate conditions for peace and freedom around the world. To my immediate left, I have Claudia Escobar, who is a lawyer and former judge of the Court of Appeals in Guatemala. During her tenure, she took a courageous stand against corruption by exposing interference. This led to her resignation when the then head of Guatemala's Congress conditioned her election on an exchange for a favorable, favorable judgment for the party and the government at the time. So she herself is a true defender of democracy and has paid the price. And then in the middle, we have Kay Rafitusan, who is a renowned political scientist, researcher, activist, and human rights defender in Madagascar and beyond. Committed to justice, Kay has dedicated her efforts to elevating the voices of those silenced, offering them support and the means to claim their rights and demand the change they deserve. She is the Vice Chair for Transparency International and has served as Transparency International Madagascar's Executive Director since 2018 when I met her. So without further ado, we're gonna get started with our panelists and I'm gonna to go to you first, Kehinde. From Sudan and Syria, where local civic actors have taken the lead in civilian protection during conflict, to Guatemala, where an anti-corruption movement had success in the courtroom and at the ballot box. We've seen the power of local citizen-led civic engagement. Of course, Humanity United is deeply engaged in those localization efforts. So how can development professionals like those in this room best live up to our commitments to have local actors really leading this work in open, closing, and closed spaces? Thank you, Shannon, and thank you to you and to Sid US chapter for having us uh, and for inviting me to be part of this conversation. Uh, it's an important one. Um, and I think the premise of your question, um, as I reflect on it, is progress, right? Like the idea of local actors being at the drivers in the driving seat, right, is something that is to me in development and evolution that we've made. So um, there's a lot of work to do, but we're making progress and we're sitting here with that premise. I think we've, it's, that's something we should applaud. Uh, and I think for me, that means honoring the, that lived experience of local actors, those people who are most proximate to the issues um, and who are most close to living in this context that we're working in and the, the, the ones who are on the front lines, right? So if we're gonna honor that means meaningful inclusion, right? So that means um, a lot of times we have conversations where we invite people to be at the table uh, we ask them a couple of questions and then we say we've participated, we've in involved human rights defenders, right? That's not meaningful inclusion. We get closer by saying, okay, so we are creating the process, you all are here, help us decide. Uh, but many folks can perceive when the central nerve is somewhere else, uh, and that central nerve is white, it's Western, it's institutional, and then we're being part of the process. And I think that meaningful inclusion does not look like that, that gets closer. Uh, and so for us at Humanity United, uh, we think of power, right? We think of our own power as donors, right? We think of our own power as folks who are in these hallowed institutions. How do we use that power, acknowledge it, right? Uh, not pretend we don't have power, but how do we share that power? How do we make sure that we're using our privilege and our voice to be at the table, uh, building trust with partners who can then say to us, actually, you got that wrong, or please don't do that again because you're causing harm. Like I think it's those people who are at the tip of the spear. Many of these folks, two of them are sitting right here next to us today. Uh, they're in courtrooms, they're judges, they're journalists doing investigative reports, putting their lives at risk, right? So how we meaningfully include them is how we get closer to what I think we're all trying to get to in this year of elections, right? Um, and I think for USAID, uh, Shannon, you and I, we've talked about the localization commitment that USAID has. And I think that's forward leaning and it's great, right? And that we should fund more people at the local level because that's closer to where we get to. But it's the beginning. We have a lot more work to do, right? And I think for uh, 
leaders in development, who are many of you are sitting in this room, we need to be thinking beyond our bottom line, and bottom line being the financial bottom line. Uh, and a friend of mine talks about sustainable impact. So how do we think about the sustainable impact of the work that we're trying to do beyond our own bottom line? So making hard choices of, we should say no to this thing because we're not the best position to do it. We should actually, in fact, let somebody else be at this table. How do we expand that table? Um, and how do we make sure the folks who are at the tip of the spear are in decision-making roles, right? Uh, I think for us as donors, that looks like being clear about our procurement processes, our internal assumptions, underlying assumptions that we make about various actors. How do we make sure that we're not being, we're not, we don't have flawed assumptions, uh, but also we create processes uh, that allow other people to be at the table and to be able to compete. Uh, it's very hard. Um, I've been, I've worked at the National Democratic Institute as an INGO, right? I know what it's like to get USA dollars and how much effort it takes to manage them how we begin to like reduce, understand that there's risk to USA dollars or risk to US government dollars, um, and we're okay with taking that risk, right? Um, some of that will be lost, if we're being honest, right? As donors at Humanity United, we're conscious of that, uh, and we say yes and still, how do we begin to do this, do this work, right? And I think changing our assumptions, I think also another piece for us is become mental health, right? Thinking about the mental health of, the mental health and well-being of folks on the front lines, right? So how do we make sure that when we're saying, here's the X amount of dollars that we're given, we're allowing you to actually have cost recovery of mental health things, or better yet, just giving general operating support so you all get to decide what is most important, rather than do I prioritize mental health or do I prioritize sending an, uh, an investigator to the field, right? How do we think differently about the work that we're trying to do? And how do we think broader picture? Because we are in a state of crisis, uh, and that crisis requires us to think differently uh, and requires us to make progress, which we are making. Uh, we need to continue to make that progress, uh, but we need to be better at meaningfully including people the, who are on the front lines, especially in this year that is so critical. Thank you, Kehinde. I'm really hoping that we can come back to some of those ideas. I think um, the idea of local actors being in the driver's seat is part of the DNA of those of us who work on democracy, human rights, and governance issues, because that's how real change happens. Um, and I'm really glad that you pulled out the need to be attuned to people's mental health and resilience issues, because we see the strain of doing this work um, on people's physical, mental, um, and other health. So I'm going to go to to you next, um, Claudia, and talk about what we can and should be doing as development professionals and international donors interested in supporting credible elections, particularly where there are risks of fraud, where transnational organized crime networks have taken root, where there are high rates of corruption, where disinformation is really clouding um, the picture in terms of what's actually going on. Like, what do you think that we should be thinking about and doing in these spaces? Thank you, thank you for inviting me to this panel. It's an honor for me to join. So I think there's a few things that can be done that the international community should be focused on supporting democracy defenders and firefighters, especially mm -hmm. when there, is election, there are elections, because that's the opportunity that we have to change a path. So I think one thing is uh, protect the defenders. We have to make sure that they have risk analysis to see what are the risks that they are facing. And hopefully they don't have to get out of the country, but sometimes um, the security becomes a real issue and you need um, safe passengers to, to get them out. You also need to create networks of solidarity. And I think that the creation of networks is extremely important for human rights defenders across borders. Uh, legal and technical assistance is also needed. In some cases, they are persecuted, they are criminalized, and they need support to defend themselves. And also, um, sometimes also to promote uh, reforms, to promote legal reforms, and also that requ requires some um, help from the legal profession. Capacity building and training is also another issue that needs to be um, focus on, you know, creating workshops and programs tailored for specific needs. Public advocacy and awareness. I think the visibility of the defenders is, is important to give them uh, the opportunity to express themselves beyond their borders. I think that the focus of the international community on what is happening in countries that are trying to build democracy is extremely important because then um, anti-democratic leaders know that they are being watched, and that can, can be also something that can help. And of course, financial support. 
because it re requires a lot of resources to fight for democracy. And I think that donors and international community should try to focus on what is needed in, in the windows of hope when we can really move forward. And also create safe heavens. I think that that's something that uh, you already talk about mental, he mental health, but sometimes um, defenders are exhausted and just need a time to regain their strength and need to get out um, of the focus and, and the fight for some time and then come back. And I think that uh, that's also something that we could be thinking about. Thank you so much, Claudia. Kay, I'm going to ask you a similar question. Um, when I met you a couple years ago in Madagascar, I was really struck about the variety of threats facing anti-corruption activists and human rights defenders, even in a country that is considered to be, you know, maybe an imperfect or flawed democracy, but a democracy nonetheless. Um, so similar question to you. What can the international community do to better support the brave efforts of activists and civil society in places like Madagascar? Yeah, thank you, Shannon. I think that, uh, you know, Claudia already elaborated a bit on this, but I will insist on the need for uh, advocating for the protection, you know, the adoption of protection laws, because this is really something that we need, especially in weak governments such as in Madagascar, there are some provisions, for instance, you know, protecting um, the defenders, uh, the, those who have been, who have witnessed some acts of corruption in our legislation. But these are very limited uh, provisions and they are not enacted at all. So we need a standalone legislation and this is not just in Madagascar. Transparency International is working in 110 countries all over the world. And two thirds of them are struggling because of this lack of protection for you know, human rights defenders and anti-corruption campaigners. So we are facing judicial harassment. We are facing strategic corruption from you know, the main sponsors of the, the duty bearers and power holders. Uh, we have, for instance, in Madagascar, we have exposed one case of uh, monopoly in the lychee trade uh, between Madagascar and Europe, and we blew the whistle against that. And then we have been summoned by the police, like we are the ones, you know, who perpetrated the crime. So this has to change. It also requires, beyond this legal protection, more collaboration between countries and governments because corruption is a transnational phenomenon and you mm -hmm. cannot tackle this only on a national level and defenders are doing what they can but they have limited powers they are just individuals and even if they strive in powerful networks such as transparency international yet we need the collaboration of governments and you know independent courts who can really break the cycle of impunity, which goes around uh, corruption. And in addition to that, there is also beyond, you know, having safe havens. It's really uh, when something happens to an anti-corruption defender, there should be an active network present for them, be ready to protect them at the very moment. Because sometimes you have cases when if I'm threatened today, I will seek out for help. Help will come, but three months later, then I'll be, maybe I'll be dead or I'll be jailed or I will lose everything I have. So it has to be an immediate response. And part of this, and this is already one of the requests we expressed towards governments and donors, is to have a kind of, of emergency visas mm -hmm. to relocate the defenders mm -hmm. in case of need. Because, you know, for applying uh, to, to visas from especially countries like ours in Madagascar to the UK, it will take three months. Uh, if you want to go to Canada, same, it even can take longer, six months. So emergency situations require emergency responses. So this is really something that we are pledging for. And, you know, one thing very important, which is very simple to do, but uh, most of the time we forget about it, is to keep talking about this, keep reminding the world 
that threatening human rights defenders, including anti-corruption campaigners, is bad. This is a really bad thing because it goes against all the commitments made, you know, towards human rights. If the defenders and uh, anti-corruption activists are doing what they are doing, it's not for the sake of, you know, uh, making a buzz or whatever. It's for protecting human rights in the countries where we are operating. We have to remember that there are strong leakages between the non-achievement of the SDGs in a few years, because we all know that we won't achieve this as a human community. Uh, there's six years left, so there are lots of doubts about that because of corruption. If we keep exposing corruption needs for, you know, giving more platform and, and also solutions for us all together as a human community to achieve those goals. So if the defenders are not protected, we lose a lot in this. And governments keep, can keep, you know, investing some money in such development efforts for protecting human rights as long as corruption is not uprooted then we will be failing as a community. So that's why we really need to invest on that. Um, these are a few, you know, ideas that we can implement, I think, very easily. We just need some real will, political will, across the global world, but also we, we don't have to, to give up, even if it's a, a kind of heavy burden. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, I, what I love about what you and Claudia just did is just really illustrate the proliferation of threats um, that a widening community of defenders is experiencing. So it's the legal threats and lawsuits, it's the physical harassment, it's the online intimidation and harassment, it's the reputational risk, and on and on and on. And the targets of those threats are just ever increasing. So we now see domestic election observers or people who are administering elections or anti-corruption activists or journalists or environmental defenders all feeling the heat um, of that pressure. And it's only getting worse in this year of elections because governments do not want to tolerate criticism or dissent because it undermines the, their electoral prospects. So it's just really important that we stay attuned to these risks and collectively mobilize to address them. That said, I promised that we were going to find those sparks of hope um, and see the glass <laughs> as half full. So Claudia, I'm gonna go back to you um, and ask the question, you know, in some instances, we have seen elections result in a U-turn or at least the opportunity to put the country on a different trajectory. When that happens, as it did recently in Guatemala, how do you want us as a community to mobilize in order to really nurture that opening? Well, I think in, in those moments, um, we need to put the eyes on the countries that are uh, having those opportunities. I think the um, set up monitoring missions of elections are very, very important. Um, I think the, the role that the international community can help together with the citizens in their countries uh, is key. As, as you said before, in Guatemala, the indigenous community had to defend the election in Guatemala because uh, we have an attorney general that is being recognized internationally as a, as a corrupt leader, and she was trying to undermine the election and to favor uh, kleptocratic leaders, kleptocratic um, politicians, and, and different powerful sectors that have controlled the country uh, for many decades. So I think that um, the role of civil society is extremely important, but needs to be backed up by the role and the focus of the international community. I think that um, legal frameworks and reforms are also important before um, something like that can happen. And that's again when we need uh, the support of the legal community. I think that we need to trust in the judicial system. If the judicial system is already corrupt, then there is a, a threat that democracy is gonna fail. And for me, the, the best tool to for, fight for democracy is really the independence of the judiciary. Mm -hmm. And that's also something that is key to fight corruption. The fight against corruption is asymmetrical because corrupt um, people have 
have networks, they have resources, they have links to organized crime, they get together to corrupt all the institutions. So we need to protect the institutions. And that's something that um, requires a lot of effort that also requires education. People need to be aware of what is going on and what is the importance of the election and what is at play. And that's when they need to also recognize when we have democratic leaders versus kleptocratic leaders who usually have, as I said before, more resources, more opportunities. So it's when um, really the democratic nations need to get together and, and help the leaders that are fighting for freedom and fighting for democracy. And that also re requires economic support and in, in different kinds. So I will uh, insist that the most important thing will be really the independence of the institutions, but especially the institutions that are um, in the justice system and the electoral system. Thank you, and that gives me an opportunity to to say that is exactly what USAID's Democracy Delivers initiative is meant to do, is to really surge those investments when there are windows of opportunity to help keep those um, you know, transitions on track and to keep that window of opportunity open for as long as possible, including by investing in democratic institutions and economic prosperity. So, so important. And we're really trying to link those two things together more deliberately. Okay, Key, K. <laughs> I keep wanting to call you Key, it's K. Um, yeah, it's good, yeah. <laughs> we talked a little bit about the defenders of democracy and the types of people who are on the front yeah. lines. Oftentimes, those people come together at the International Anti-Corruption Conference, which is happening in June. Um, what are your hopes for this year's conference? And in particular, um, you and I have talked about this before, but like, what is the role of young people um, as you know, people who are really on their front lines defending democracy and calling for free and fair elections? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Shannon. I will start with this last question, you know, because uh, we are here to find the sparkles of hope and young people are the ones uh, in the anti-corruption world because it's, it's, as I said, it's a heavy environment and difficult to handle with. But we have witnessed through our 110 chapters that young people are there and ready to fight corruption. And that's the main hope that we have. The reason why they are ready to fight back against corruption is that they are witnessing, you know, the weight of this corruption on their daily lives. And they are witnessing what strategic corruption and klepto kleptocracy is doing at the global level because most of those violent conflicts, those wars that we have today across the world are fueled by corruption. That's the thing. So the younger generations, I would say, is hoping for more peace and more sustainability in their livelihoods. And they are hoping for more. They are just hoping in some countries for access to basic, you know, services, because this is also something which is ripped out by corruption. Uh, for instance, we have a, a project that we are doing right now, I mean, as a movement with Global Affairs Canada, and the aim is really to support young women and girls to access basic services, including healthcare and education. And this uh, is done through tackling corruption, and this is something good, this is working. Uh, and once again, young people as well can be great warriors against corruption because they have new ideas and they are very fond of technologies. You know, we are in an era where uh, artificial intelligence is everywhere, but we have to seize the opportunity to, to learn what are the pros and cons of such technology because the corrupt people and networks are also using them. But young people are very good in terms of creativity, you know, creating anti-corruption apps, for instance, or, you know, really using those softwares and technology for sparkling and pushing for good initiatives. So that's something that we have to sustain very globally. Now, coming to the ISCC, um, we will have the 21st edition already of the International Anti-Corruption Conference this year. 
And this is really one of the signature events of Transparency International, uh, along with uh, the ISEC Council. And this year, we, we will hold the conference in Vilnius, in Lithuania, because it's very symbolic. Uh, Lithuania gained its independence back 30 years ago. So we really wanted to organize the conference in a country which has resisted to, against autocracy and has committed to fight against corruption to build a healthier democracy. So we would like to learn lessons from that government. That's why we will be there. And the philosophy of the ISEC has always been, you know, to gather a community of practitioners around the topic of, of anti-corruption. So that will be policymakers, activists, researchers from all walks of life. It's really a community, people from academia, uh, journalists, investigative journalists, are also pillars of anti-corruption, to really, first of all, discuss, the, discuss about the trends of anti-corruption, what is going on right now, what are the new tactics adopted by corrupt people, because corruption is always in motion, and so are we. We anti-corruption fighters have also to evolve with that and to adjust our strategies accordingly. So the ISEC brings that opportunity. And this year's topic uh, will be confronting global threats, standing up for integrity. I think that it, it says it all, because those violent conflicts also again are multiplying across the world, and we need a remedy. And that remedy is related to the fight against corruption, but beyond that, we need to rebuild integrity around the world and at all levels. So that will be the main focus. So we will have, you know, uh, discussions around seven uh, thematic tracks. Defending the defenders is the first of them. So that's why I was really, you know, happy when you decided to convene me to this great event. I flew uh, directly from Madagascar to be here. So I can tell you it's a pretty long way. But, but it's really important to tell the world that this is important. Defending the defenders, that's the main thing. And then you have, uh, we will explore also the linkages between corruption, democracy, of course, but also human rights, very importantly, and also environmental crimes, because this is running all across the globe, you know. Uh, the Amazonian forest is disappearing, it's fueled by corruption. In Madagascar, there is a huge uh, wildlife trafficking, turtles flown to China. This is about corruption. All of this uh, destruction of human and environmental heritages around the globe is linked to that. So we need also to find a strategy. Uh, so many things go in uh, through, through the discussions, but what we really want to do is to build on the previous momentums because Last ISEC was here in DC, uh, co-hosted by the US government. And uh, at the closing of this ISEC in 2022, we were discussing about the need to strengthen the anti-corruption community and coalition. So it is now the time to make that happen beyond words and commitments. I mean, it's really time for action because in, during those two years, things are tremendously changed and shifted in a negative way. Our corruption perceptions index have shown that there is a stagnation in the fight against corruption. The rates of corruption are going higher around the world, but the fight against corruption is stagnating. Mm. And this is something that we have measured during the last decade. So it is high time to do something. We need to kick, I mean, we need to make things move. Uh, uh, and to really be creative and innovative. So that's the point of being, getting together in Vilnius. And to conclude with that, uh, you know that in last December, there was also the COSP-10, the Conference of State Parties to the United Nations uh, Convention Against Corruption, and that happened here in the US again, in Atlanta. Uh, a lot has been achieved because we celebrated the 20th anniversary of the UNCAC. That's a big win. Some things have been achieved, but there is also a huge gap still in terms of implementation of that convention. In all many points, and 
defending the defenders is once again part of it, the need to have in national and regional legislations to protect anti-corruption activists is striking. So getting into Vilnius will give us a platform to discuss about the resolutions which has been made there. So this is an open invitation to all of you. I hope to see you there in June. Thank you, Thank you so much. So all three of you guys have talked about the importance of coalitions and networks. Um, and Kahinde, as you know, during the most recent decade, there has been more civic mobilization than ever before. USAID, through Powered by the People, a new initiative is really trained to invest in building social movements. I know Humanity United has as well. So the question is really like, how do you see us needing to tap into the momentum um, and the vibrancy of social movements in this year of elections? Uh, thank you. Uh, and I, I like this question because I feel like it's the opposite of the response I gave you earlier, right? Because I think at HU, we often think of this as, we hear a lot of false choices. And I think we often sound like we're making a false choice as well. It's local actors or yes. the international community. And the truth is we're all, we all need to be part of this conversation, right? Like the crisis that we described, the crisis that you uh, two have talked about today are immense. Uh, so there's enough things for all of us to do, right? Um, and when we think of the ideas that young people have been on the streets protesting, folks have been in courtrooms fighting for rights, folks have been monitoring elections, doing investigative reporting, all these things. So. Uh, authoritarians and autocrats might be getting smarter, they might be getting better at their work, but there's also moments of hope, right? I think that there's moments of hope that we all have here um, and that folks are doing great work. So I think the question is, how do we as the international community and the development community sort of marshal our own action to get there, uh, to be able to support them and to have them meet this moment? So I think some of that is retooling our own efforts and reimagining what the world can look like. What does the world look like to be able to say, yes, we're going to use our voice to say to you, Shannon, as the uh, AA at state, I mean, at USAID, not state, <laughs> but, but, yeah, at USAID, this is what we need you to do. This is how we need you to platform people. This is how we need you to support emergency visas. Like, I think that there's concrete examples of ways that we can yeah. use our voice and how we think about that as like the work that we have to do, I think is a necessary part of this. I think there's also the role of us as uh, building solidarity. I think that there's a lot of solidarity movements, uh, and we've seen some of this begin to happen. Folks in um, Nigeria connecting with folks in Zambia, folks in uh, various places. So like, I think this global solidarity movement uh, is a thing that we need more of, right? And I think it's a, a thing that us as development uh, practitioners can help uh, further move further along, right? Uh, and I think the the thing is human rights defenders as we talk about have a lot of risk so how do we begin to like carry the risk some of those risks right i think there's places where it's impossible or perhaps inappropriate to actually give funds directly to organizations right uh, or to local actors because it actually puts them at risk right there's a natural role for us to step into and say we we're able to like take that risk and we we're able to like do that on behalf of folks to support that work right i think that there's uh, any number of um, folks in this room have decades of experience doing development work. How do we put that into action to support people? If we say this is a crisis, then let's all be creative and let's think about what's the role we have. How do we build that, those movements? Uh, I think our, at Humanity United, our peace building team, been doing a lot of work around sort of like understanding the nexus between anti-corruption efforts and social movements. And again, we really do see that when those things come together, you can address regulatory reform, you can address uh, financial constraints and all these other things. Uh, so we know that there's a there's a roadmap. Uh, folks like Kay and folks like Cardi have shown us what that looks like. How do we enter that, I think, is part of the conversation. And I think one of the things we often talk about is the Western institutions. Our banks, like in many places, are safe havens, right? Like autocrats park their funds in our backyard, right? So like, what is our role as folks who are in these spaces to say the way that we don't actually have, the way that we reduce kleptocracies by figuring out how do we reduce the ways that the, the, being the intakers of those funds, right? How do we create the regulatory framework and put pressure on our own stakeholders, you all in government, our financial institutions, and any number of places. So like, I think the social movements, our social movements in the countries we, we are working and support are doing their bit. There's a lot more that we can do on this end. Mm. Thank you so much. So now we have time to take a couple of questions from the audience. I hope that this has been as inspiring for you as it has been for me and that it's provoked some thoughts and some good questions. So we have uh, folks passing around mics. I see the first hand right in the center of the room. Thank you, Julie. I'm Siddharth Shah from Greenleaf Integrative. And 
Thank you. Really love that you're putting this on center stage for us. I have a question about the countermeasures towards the violence, th death threats that come from non-state sources in these countries. It seems to me that the international community has particular power over state-sourced violence, verbal violence, social media violence. Are there any countermeasures that you can speak to to deal with the trauma of feeling that walking out the door may mean physical threat to one's family and others? And I think we're all feeling that here in this country as well, that things can get very heated, but you're speaking to something that's of or orders of magnitude more and wanted to hear about how to deal with non-state threats to human rights defense. Thank you so much. Let's take one or two more. Oh, over here. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for all the panelists as well. Uh, I would like to see everyone's perspective on the contribution of the private sector in the fight against corruption. Uh, particularly your strategies around engaging the private sector and private sector associations. Thank you. Anyone on this side of the room? Thank you. Uh, Simon Conte with the Cloudburst Group. Uh, first of all, my thanks and compliments to the panel uh, for your contributions today and all the work that you do. Um, I'd be interested in hearing your perspectives on any of the learning gaps that are holding back the advancement of this field. Um, at Cloudburst, we're currently working with the elections and political processes team at USAID to develop first and test uh, an election assessment framework uh, that helps identify country-specific needs and opportunities, uh, as well as an election assistance after action review methodology to help USAID identify best practices for electoral assistance. But what other types of research and analysis are needed to help advance this field? Great questions, and we thank you for that support. Um, okay, so one on countering the threats from non-state actors, second on the role of the private sector, and third on learning gaps, particularly when it comes to elections and political processes. You want to start, Kennedy? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, I'll take the private sector one. Um, and I think, so there's a lot here that I, for at least for us at HU, we began with the, what was sort of private sector should do things, but actually I think we all now believe private sector has a responsibility. So I think part of this is the, how do we, what is the, what are the things that we think private sector need to do? We all know, to case point, mm -hmm. development matters and you, so, corruption is a, a De corruption reduces development, right? Corruption reduces democ democratic tra uh, trajectory. So how do we make sure that we are being in partnership with private sector actors? And I think it's what is the bottom line and how do we use bottom line language to have this conversation? But also how do we make sure we're still using rights-based frameworks? Because it's not just about the bottom line, right? It's about the what's the work that we want, what, the, what we want the world to look like and how do we get closer to doing that? So like, I think it's finding, for us, it's been finding that nexus. So we're not necessarily antagonistic, but we also believe that there's a responsibility and how do we marry those things together? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Claudia. Yeah, I think that it's important to take into consideration we are in a globalized world and many of the countries have free trade agreements. I think that the free trade agreements need to enhance the provisions against corruption to promote the rule of law. And I think a great example are the European Union agreements and how they really have uh, promote the rule of law in different countries. And that's an example that can be followed in other regions and it could help as a tool to promote uh, the rule of law and to fight corruption in countries where there is um, a lack of democratic um, values. Yeah, I would like to elaborate on that because the question of, of uh, the implication of the private sector in the corrupt world, but also in anti-corruption is very important. So uh, one of our strategic approaches within Transparency International is to really seeking for building a more ethical economy through, you know, uh, building integrity in business as well. And we can do that, for instance, for building integrity pacts, for fighting corruption in procurements, public procurements, for instance, involving uh, uh, some 
sometimes foreign, you know, or lo even local companies. So integrity pacts is something that Transparency has, in Transparency International, I mean, has launched since 20 years now and practicing with success in several countries. So this is something that can be replicated for adding more ethics into those economies. And I will say, uh, also answering to the gentleman's question on, on the areas which has to be explored, you know, uh, in making those fight more efficient, I think that there are three main priorities that we are uh, uh, also advocating for, and you know that. The first one is the transparency of political finance uh, around the world. That will really greatly contribute to, to the restoration of democracy because we have so much opacity. Uh, I won't even just talk about my country, Madagascar. We had presidential elections last year, and that was a so total mess. And, you know, there is no readiness from political parties and politicians to disclose the deals behind those elections. But we need to, as a global community, to find ways to make that mandatory. Second one would be beneficial ownership transparency. And this is already something that has been pushed in various sectors. But once again, now is high time to make it happen beyond commitments. And third of all, I think that protecting civic space is a real need mm. uh, because whether it's for building democracy, uh, fighting against corruption, defending the defenders, if we don't have an open civic space, then things will remain, you know, complicated for all of us in the room. So that has to be a common target. And right now, as we are speaking, our chapter in Brazil is facing cyber attacks, for instance, judicial harassment. Our chapter in Madagascar had 12 cyber attacks the last month only, and this is something going viral across the globe. So once again, we need a global solution as well towards this uh, struggle. Can I just throw in one last thing? Sure. Yeah. So last, uh, this year, the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights that the U.S. government just released, right? I think implementing that in full force, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that I think several of us hoped would be there. That's fine. What is there? Actually, imp implementing a whole of government approach to business and human rights would go a long way from the U.S.'s perspective. Yes. Thank you so um, much. So I wanted to take the prerogative of being the moderator to answer a couple of the questions as well from USAID's perspective. So on the learning agenda or learning gaps, very much to Kay's points, I think that we're seeing the intersection of DRG subsectors mm -hmm. as being so critical for safeguarding the integrity of elections. So we're looking at what is the impact of a lack of transparency when it comes to political finance and a lack of enforcement of the rules on the credibility and competitiveness of elections? What is the impact of information manipulation on people's perceptions and of the actual credibility of elections? Similarly, civic space, um, as Kay said, where civic space is constrained and there are all of these restrictions on civil society, public gatherings, the media, it's really hard to see how you can have a truly competitive and free and fair election. So a lot of the things that we're looking at at USAID are how do all of these areas in which we work really come together um, when it comes to preserving the integrity of elections. On the private sector question, it is so important when it comes to anti-corruption, we see that the private sector can play a very positive role or it can play a very negative role, including in the kinds of norms um, that the private sector helps distribute in the societies in which they are working and investing, which is why under our grand challenge on countering transnational corruption, we've made an entire um, work stream around engaging with the private sector to really like raise the game when it comes to standards of ethical um, business practices. And we have a current activity that is about propelling integrity in the private sector so that they can be allies and champions of anti-corruption. And then finally, on the non-state actor question, it's so important, and I don't think there's any easy answers, but it goes back to, I think, what maybe Kay said, or maybe it was Claudia, about 
really thinking proactively about the risks that all of these individuals face. And as donors and as partners, doing that risk analysis and that scenario planning and making sure that we have clauses in our contracts and our grants um, to provide nimble on-demand support to make sure that we are um, paying for and prepared for enhanced security, that we're prepared for the kinds of mental health and resilience support that people will inevitably need. There's also some really interesting stuff going on in terms of using technology and AI to defend against like the online harassment and intimidation that's happening. So again, not an easy answer, but I think really important for us to think outside of the box about how we go about defending the defenders from the multitude of risks that they face from both state and non-state actors. Claudia, was there something you wanted to add real quick? No. Okay, so with that, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I really want to thank these amazing panelists and all of you for being such an engaged audience. And in this critical year of elections, I hope that we can count on all of you as partners and allies and supporters and champions of the folks who are defending democracy for all of us. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Claudia, Kay, and Kahinde. Um, everybody in the room uh, here and everybody online, we have a lot more going on. We have breakout panels in person and virtual at 2, which is in nine minutes. Um, we have more breakouts at 3. And then we'll reconvene in here. The exhibit hall is also open in person and until 4. And then we'll reconvene in here at 4 for our closing plenary. So um, please move along to your next sessions. Thank you.